Bolum's test, an irrelevant principle, or can it be applied today where medical malpractice has been on the rise? We have a complete analysis. Welcome to TLA Today. My name is Hazem Ashraf Hishamuddin. We are coming to you today from Taylor's University, Subang Jaya, Malaysia. Now, you may not be familiar with the term tort, but you have definitely come across lots of tort cases on social media and newspapers. When it comes to the standard of care in medical negligence, the Bolin's test was established. However, to what extent is the test relevant in determining the standard of care in medical negligence in the United Kingdom and Malaysia today? What are the arguments for and against Bolin's test? What might the law for medical negligence look like in the next century? We will try to answer those questions for you. Before I introduce the panel of well-established professionals who will be contributing their opinion on this matter, it is important to understand what is meant by the term the law of torts. Now, it is stated that tortious liability arises from the breach of a duty primarily fixed by law. This duty is towards persons generally and its breach is redressable by an action of unliquidated damages. Now, it is important to know that there are three elements of tort. Firstly, intentional tort, negligence torts, and strict liability torts. Today, we will be focusing on negligence torts, specifically medical negligence. With that being said, let's go straight to the introductions. On my right, we have Ms. Pasha Akil, an attorney general specializing in medical law. She believes that the bone test should be made. Beside her, we have Ms. Jacqueline Lee Suke, a Supreme Court judge with five years of experience. She believes that the bonus test should be abolished as it allows doctors to be excused from liabilities. Next to me, we have Megan Chun, an advocate and representative of the UK Bar Council. She acquires a neutral sense. Next to her, we have Mr. Amin, who will be providing us with a Malaysian perspective. And lastly, we have Ms. Chong Foy Moon, a thesis writer who will be giving us an idea of the international context of the Boyle's test. Thank you all for joining us today. So I want to begin with how medical negligence is in point of us right now. Perhaps um, Ms. Jacqueline, could you explain this? Negligence is known to be a failure to take reasonable care to avoid causing injury or loss to another person that a reasonable, prudent person would have exercised in a similar situation. There are three elements to be satisfied in proving negligence. Firstly, that there must be a legal duty on the part of the defendant to the claimant. Secondly, that there is a breach of that duty. And lastly, that the claimant has faced consequential damages due to the defendant's actions. It is important to note that the nature of the duty varies from thought to thought. For example, when negligence is alleged, the duty is to take reasonable care. In the case of trespass to person, the duty is to refrain from infringing a person's bodily integrity. If any of this cannot be proved, the claim fails. Referring to the second element of negligence, a breach of duty refers to the standard of care that is appropriate to the duty owed. A breach of duty occurs when the party owing the particular duty fails below the standard of behavior required by the particular duty in question. The behaviour of the defendant is compared to the behaviour of an ordinary person under ordinary circumstances. This is known as the reasonable man's test, as established in Glasgow Corporation and Moon. However, when a defendant has special skills or qualifications, you have to compare him or her with a reasonable person with the relevant skills or qualifications. Alright, however, I understand that when it comes to the medical cases, it's a bit different. Perhaps, um, Pasha, could you explain this? Medical negligence is in many ways a specialist type of negligence action. Here, the defendant is compared to a reasonable person with the same specialism and status. For example, a general practitioner is not judged by the same standards as a consultant cardiologist. It is important because of the dramatic increase in the number of claims against the doctors and health authorities. Studies have found that 75% of doctors in lower-risk specialties had faced a malpractice claim at some point in their careers. For doctors in high-risk specialties, that number skyrockets to 
This has led to a worry that the UK will follow the USA, where medical malpractice claims and the so-called ambulance chasing by lawyers is commonplace. Doctors are not exempt from the law, just like everyone else. If they fail below the standard of care that is appropriate to them, they may be found liable in negligence for a breach of their well-established duty of care to their patients. Professionals, doctors in particular, who are specific body of professionals, do not conform to the usual rules regarding the breach of duty in negligence and therefore are more appropriately considered as a separate category as identified in Justice McNair in Bolem and, Bolem and Frank Hospital Management Committee. Now, when we talk about the case of Bolin and Fine, which established the Bolin's test, how is it actually applied? Perhaps um, Ms. Bolin, could you further? In the case of Bolin against Friend Hospital Management, the defendant was the body which employed a doctor who had given a mentally ill patient muscle relaxing drug, nor restrained him prior to giving him electroconvulsive therapy. The claimant suffered injuries including broken bones. The hospital also failed to inform him of the risk of breaking his bones from this treatment. The, doc, the claimant then brought a claim of cost action with the High Court held that the doctor hadn't reached his duty to the patient, and so the defendant was not liable. It was concluded that as long as the defendant acted in a way which, which a responsible body of other doctors would really consider to be correct, he has not fallen, fallen below the standard of a professional. Also, when applying this test, it includes consent, examination and diagnosis, choice of treatment, and level of expertise. I see. Now, has this been applied to Malaysia as well? Up until the late 90s, the Willems test has been followed in cases such as Chin Chiao and Government of Malaysia, as we follow the UK. Here, the plaintiff, Ama, was given penicillin injection at a clinic, and she died an hour later. The doctor was found negligent because he failed to act on information where her medical card did show that she was allergic to penicillin. The High Court decided that the doctor should be held liable for negligence. However, the Federal Court held that he was not liable since a wrong diagnosis per se is no evidence of negligence. The Privy Council stepped in and overturned the decision of the Federal Court and agreed with the High Court that the doctor was negligent as it was expressly written on the patient's card that she was allergic to penicillin. Bolam's principles were applied. It was further applied in Kao Nan Singh and Nagama as well as Shalia Anaklaki Manikam and Government of Malaysia. However, it is important to note that Malaysia has had a tendency to look to other jurisdictions, particularly Commonwealth countries, in forming its laws. Well, in regards to the case of Sidaway and governors of Belton Royal and Maltsy Hospital, the plaintiff had to undergo an operation to her spine to relieve pain in her right arm and shoulder. However, she was not informed to the 1% risk that she may suffer to her spine. While the operation was performed without any negligence, she suffered the 1% risk and became severely disabled, hence suing the defendants for failing to inform all risks involved. Here, the House of Lords held that the defendant were not liable because the surgeon had followed the approved practice of neurosurgeons in not disclosing the risk of spinal cord surgery and was likewise not negligent. This was further confirmed in the application of Bolems and the appeal failed. Therefore, is the Bolems test always applied when it comes to a medical case? Absolutely not. There is a descending judgment of Lord's Commons in the case of Sidaway. It was held that the Bolem should not apply to the issue of informed consent and that a doctor should have a duty to tell the patient of the inherent and material risk of the treatment proposed. This was proven in the case of Chester and Asha. Now, um, your psychological background stems from study of principles and the relationship between people, right? So, what is your take on the informed consent and what are we actually talking about here? Well, yes, it is understood that under the ethical rules of conduct, an informed consent is one of the core considerations that as there is a moral responsibility to protect patients. Thus, Informed consent ensures a patient is fully aware of all of the risks and costs involved in a treatment or a procedure. Therefore, he or she has the right to decide whether or not to undergo the treatment. Oh yes, I attended a discussion where it was mentioned that in Montgomery and Lanarkshire Health Board, the Supreme Court replaced the Bolin's test for consent with a test where the materiality of risk involved had to be assessed 
by reference not to a responsible body or medical opinion, but by reference to a reasonable person in the patient's position. Doctors, as a result, are now obliged to reasonable care to ensure that the patient is aware of any material risk involved in any recommended treatment and of any reasonable alternative or variant treatment. This then relates to the patient's right to obtain consent, which is actually derived from a human's right to information and the right to freedom of choice. So what you're telling me is that giving consent is one thing, but actually um, letting them decide whether or not to undergo the treatment is another? Actually, in England, the courts have applied the bullying test to determine if the doctor has sufficient explain, sufficiently explained the treatment or one the patient. This approach is based on a very sensible considerations. If the doctor is required to explain every possible risk, he could do more harm. For instance, where the risks involved are relatively remote, a court in India has held that there were obvious disadvantages in warning a patient such risk. It was stated that not only do you alarm unnecessarily, you also have the potential to put him in a position where he feels that he should he should take the decision, albeit the doctor is obviously much better qualified to weigh out the, the advantages and the desirability of the proposed operations as against the risks. In Singapore, the Court of Appeal adopted a new legal test to determine whether a doctor had been negligent while dispensing medical advice. In the recent case of P. G. Cock against Ping Ping Jin and another, the courts decided to use a modification of the so-called Hungary test which considers whether the patient is receiving useful medical information rather than if it follows a common practice. A patient receiving the medical advice is not a passive recipient of care as one element is being diagnosed or treated. Rather, the patient plays an active role because ultimately the patient should decide on the course of treatment. If any. Needless to say, the patient can make an informed judgment only if he has sufficient advice and information. The Montgomery test will be applied to the facts and circumstances as they exist at the time of the material event offered. The Montgomery test has three stages. First, the patient must prove that relevant and material, and material information was withheld from him. Secondly, if yes, the court will decide if the doctor had even had the information at the first place. And finally, the court will decide whether it was justifiable for the doctor to withhold that information from the patient. So, I have a question. To what extent is providing advice or disclosing the risk involved in a procedure sufficient, seeing that your psycholo psychological background can um, be implemented here? What, what's your sense? Well, this is a rather tricky question, which leads back to my previous point on providing informed consent to protect all patients. If we define sufficiency as providing all of the information in relation to the surgical procedure, this could also affect the moral principle of protection. Why would I say so? Take bariatric surgery for diabetes remission. The surgery already involves multiple degree of risk. The most evident would be bleeding, infection, leaking from the side where the section of stomach or small intestine or both, blood clots as well in the legs. However, we could go further to state that the blood clot from the legs can move up to the lungs and the heart leading to breathing difficulties and potentially heart problems that requires more surgery. Otherwise, it may cause suffocation and potentially cardiac arrest. These risks are complications that could occur during the surgery itself. What if the surgery went well, but your internal bodies may not react well towards it? This leads to more risk to be disclosed. Later symptoms could include body not absorbing the nutrients well, causing health problems such as anemia or even gastric band erosion. This goes in agreement with Ms. Harsha when risk analysis would come into play. When penalizing doctors for not disclosing information with a minor risk, this will be on the basis of two. Number one, doctors have to attend to other patients too. Explaining this many medical jargons consumes valuable time as his job is extremely urgent. Number two, providing each and every detail regarding the risk involved will only lead to psychological distress, anxiety, or even doubt that may not be necessary seeing that the risk is on an average median to be very low. 
these anxiety producing thoughts will only increase their chances of pulling out from a very effective treatment that is not in the best interest of their current suffering. In America, a different principle was long accepted. In contrast to the lack of recognition of concept of rights in the UK, American courts rather focus on more fundamental rights of the patients to make an informed decision about medical procedures. This includes patient consent and medical information rather than malpractice which is given more weightage in English law. Justice Cardozo, an associate justice of the Supreme Court of the US stated, every human being of adult years and sound mind has the right to determine what should be done with his own body. Using this as a basis of the starting point, most US, US courts have upheld patients' right not to be given medical tests or treatments without being fully informed consent on his or her part. Without fully informed consent, th these tests or treatments were considered unlawful. If harm resulted, the patient could sue and recover for damages. The patient had to be told of the material risks, complications and side effects. The logic behind this is, without such information, the patient was considered to be incapable of giving consent that was necessary to authorize medical procedures in the first place. This principle is also considered less paternalistic and more respectful of individual bodily spiritual integrity. Also, it's more likely to solve the problem resulting from lack of communication and spiritual integrity. Also, it was more likely to solve problems resulting from the lack of communication between patients and medical practitioners. Critics on the other hand suggested that this principle is re results in defensive me medicine and essentially also causes a fundamental lack of trust between patients and doctors. This then confuses and bombards patients unnecessarily with information that they do not want to hear or even need to hear. This also overwhelms them with information which they may not fully understand and possibly alarming them needlessly about the risks which were too remote. All of this while taking up time which could be better spent treating the patient rather than talking to them. The critics pointed out that it is a myth that anyone can be fully informed about anything at least in an absolute sense. Still, less than such perfection is usually what is required by the law. Adding to what was being said about fully informed, people in the medical profession have expressed their fears concerning the ability to be able to explain to the patients all the potential pitfalls of the procedure. Several researchers have conducted studies to determine the comprehension of patients in relation to information they have, they have been given about the conditions. One of the studies conducted was by Rogers in 2000. He examined the level of understanding patients with heart failure, had constructed from consultation with the doctors. He noted that many did not fully understand the pro prognosis of their condition of the treatment that their doctors were proposing. So it was stated earlier that the best interest rule permits the doctor to select information to be disclosed as, so as to promote the effectiveness of the treatment which is in their best interest or their suffering. Could you um, explain further on this? Okay, so the best interest rule was established as a standard medical treatment involving the incapacitated patient in, in rehab. Here, a lot of random judgment echoed that of Justice Wood in T against T. In the latter, Justice Wood declared that when the patient is suffering from such mental abnormality as never to be able to give such consent, a medical practitioner is justified in taking such steps as good medical practice demands. Among the former, Lord Brandon determined that it would be lawful to administer treatment to an incapacitated adult, provided that the operation or other treatment concern is in the best interest of the patient. So, um, is there any particular reason uh, doctors have the authority to choose the information which they can disclose? Within the area of informed consent, further difficulties are added when either the patient is a minor or the patient has a mental condition which prevents them from being able to make rational choices for themselves. This is particularly the case in relation to those who have to be forcibly placed in mental instit institutions either for their own safety or for the safety of others. According to the case of Ingrid F, which was a case that involved steril sorry, sterilization of a mental patient, the subject of the judgment was a 36-year-old mentally handicapped woman who lived voluntarily in a mental hospital and had the mental age of a small child. The woman had developed a sexual relationship with a male pa patient. The woman's doctor were of the view that the woman would not cope with pregnancy and childbirth and because no other method of contraception was desirable and because it would not be in the woman's best interest for the staff to prevent her activity 
and it was considered in the patient's best interest to be sterilized. However, it's important to note that there was a dissenting judgment in this case, in the case of Henry Ab, sorry. Lloyd Goff held that it is well established that as a general rule, the performance of a medical operation upon a person without his or her lawful consent, as constituting both the crime of battery and the sort of trespass to person. Furthermore, before Justice Scott Baker, in the Court of Appeal, there was common ground between the parties that there was no power in the court to give consent on behalf of F the proposed operation of sterilization or to dispense with the need of such consent. So, under the psychological perspective, does it permit uh, doctors to do so? To a certain extent, yes, as medical professionals are capable of taking into account a range of factors, medical, emotional, social, which could have a bearing on the decision. Since their job scope allows for a first-hand experience with how a patient will likely act, medical professionals will have also built a relationship with both the patient themselves and also the patient carers, and are therefore likely to be accurately aware of the context in which the decision needs to be made and the factors influencing it. However, the same cannot be said for the courts, as it does have a partic particular philosophical concern. The expression best interest enjoys a measure of legal status that I believe is disproportionate to its usefulness. A patient's best interests are not necessarily confined to best medical interests. The reasoning that allows a clinician to act and make a determination on behalf of a patient with incapacity is not without difficulty. Medical procedures should be patient-centered and not doctor-centered. Doctors should state all that is factual and not what they believe is significant. Then, it should be designated by the patient themselves to decide which risk stated is significant and can deter themselves from following through with the procedure. Patients have the first-hand experience as well to identify which risks in which may be concerning for them. But of course, as stated earlier, this also has its own practical complication. This point can also be demonstrated in 2016. Strauss and Thomas criticized the Bonham test for its extension beyond its intended limits, allowing the standard in law to be set subjectively by expert witnesses, often ignoring plaintiff's arguments. Specifically, Lord Scarman noted with, the, with Bonham the realm of diagnosis and treatment. Negligence is not established by preferring one respectable body of professional opinion to another. In particular, the arguments on behalf of the plaintiffs should not be ignored in favour of the standard of care set subjectively by expert witnesses for the defence. It was emphasised in Mrs A and East Kent Hospital's NHS Foundation Trust that the assessment of whether a risk is material cannot be reduced to percentages. The significance of a given risk is likely to reflect a variety of factors besides its magnitude. For example, the nature of the risk, the effect which its occurrence would have upon the life of the patient, the importance of, to the patient of the benefits sought to be achieved by the treatment, the alternatives available, and the risks involved in those alternatives. The assessment is therefore fact sensitive and sensitive also to the characteristics of the patient. In context, the Bonham test is unexceptional and governs all forms of professional liability. It is not special pleading for doctors. The very nature of professional services involves the exercise of skills and the possession of a body of knowledge not shared by the public at large. Judges are not qualified to make professional judgments on the practices of other learned professions. Moreover, it has been identified that the Bolan test is easily misused as shown in the case of Dr. Frutas. Only 11 surgeons out of 1,000 supported the defendant's action. Criticized as being excessively differential to medical opinion when balanced against the rights of a patient to be told about the risks and benefits of medical intervention. Should this be the case when clearly the standard of care is a question of reasonableness? Should it not be left to the court to appraise what would be reasonable under the circumstances and to state the expected standard, thus defining the boundaries of reasonable conduct? Court, on the other hand, has no vested interest as it is not, as they are not the defendants in question. 
The Bolland test is thereby enlarging the role of the doctor to, to that of a moral arbiter. It is not generalizable to the populace, as decision made is dependent on the doctor of each case. Whereas the effect of Bolito is that the court will inquire more closely into the justification of defendant's doctor's practice based on the logical analysis of why such an opinion was formed, as well as a risk analysis against the competing opinion. With all that being said, let's turn to the applicability of the Bolito's test in Malaysia. Well, prior to 29th December 2006, the test for medical, medical negligence accepted by the courts in Malaysia was generally known as the Bolum's Principle. However, it can be seen that there is a departure from Bolum. The Federal Court, the Apex Court in Malaysia, on the 29th of December 2006, in its judgment in the case of Fu Fiona and Dr. Suk Fuk Mun, declared inter alia that the Bolum's test, which has been the basis in determining the standard of care in medical negligent cases in Malaysia since her independence in 1957, is no longer applicable in all aspects of medical negligence. Federal Court Judge Siti Norma Yaakub, in delivering the judgment of the Federal Court, deemed that the Rogers and Whitaker test was more appropriate. She also borrowed a quote from Lord Wolfe, the phrase, the doctor knows best, should now, should now be followed by the qualifying words, if he acts reasonably and logically and gets his facts right. However, the courts further held that there is a need for members of the medical profession to stand up to the, medical, to the wrongdoings, if any, as in the case of professionals in other professions. In so doing, people involved in medical negligence cases would be able to obtain better professional advice and that the courts would be appraised with evidence that would assist them in their deliberations. Now, what about cases after Fufiana? The mention of Nixakis and General Western Hospital, Western General so Hospital, sorry, by Siti Norma Yaakub in Fu Fiona has left the door open to the expulsion of the Bolum's test in Malaysia as a whole. The real divide post Fu Fiona, however, is the issue of evaluation of expert professional opinion. The divide is seen in the case of Hassan Datullah and Governor of Malaysia on one hand, and Lecce Manavasaga on the other. In Hassan Datullah, the right to make a determination on medical negligence now rests with the court upon evaluation of evidence which includes the opinion and practices of members of the medical profession. In other words, the evaluation of expert professional opinion is treated equally as all other evidence when it comes to medical negligence. This is consistent with Rogers and Whitaker, where the majority stated that the standard of care is not determined solely or even primarily by reference to the practice followed by other medical practitioners. On the other hand, Lecture Maravasaga was a case which turned on the issues of advice and treatment by the doctor to the patient. In dismissing the claim, Justice Rohana Yusuf stated that as per the Bolito test, the defendant had not been negligent. The Bolito test expands upon Willem's test, stating that a compliance with reasonable, respectable, and responsible practice will more often than not absolve a doctor of liability. So why was Bolito applied in this situation when Fu Fiona clearly established that Willem's test had been rejected? This strange amalgamation of both Rogers and Whitaker and Bolito means that the seat of determination in the medical aspect of diagnosis, advice, and treatment is the court. However, on the issue of assessment of evidence, the evidence of experts are treated as influential or decisive evidence unless the, expert unless the expert professional opinion is not in compliance with reasonable, respectable, and responsible practice. That, would have, that was a bit of insight into Mrs. stance regarding the Bolum's principle. On one hand, as per Fu Fiona, the Bolum's test was technically rejected. However, to some extent, it lives on in the form of Bolito in the aspect of evaluation of evidence. The debate as to whether the ratio in the federal court decision of Fu Fiona was intended or meant to be restricted to cases related to negligent advice only, and not to all aspects of medical negligence, continues. Fu Fiona has not been revisited or reconsidered in any federal court decision on medical negligence post December 2006. Due to the perceived uncertainty, the medical profession and defense counsel face many difficulties. To resolve the uncertainty, a review of the law of medical negligence needs to be undertaken to clear the lingering doubts. Legislation, as was enacted in Australia after Nexicus and Western General Hospital, may be necessary to address the concerns of the medical profession and its advisors in Malaysia. So, um, I pose a question to all of you at the beginning of this discussion. So, uh, what do you think? Is a bonus test an irrelevant principle, or can it be applied today, where medical practice has been on the rise? Dr. Thomas Abraham as well once said that although many challenges and advancements have occurred, still the overriding gold standards of defense in medical negligence is, is the bonus test. 
Therefore, I am still in favor of the application of both tests in medical land regions as it provides uniformity and consistency. As discussed from various sources, Bolivar should be applied as it holds doctors liable only when they have an affected language indeed. The Bolivar test should be abolished, replaced by Bolivar, as seen in the case of Shaw and South Trees Hospital and the Chance Foundation Trust. Yeah, I, I agree it is applied in limited extent, such as the application in Malaysia. I believe it's that it should be analyzed on a more dimensional manner, taking into consideration the different natures of different societies, and it also reflects the difference in social uh, positions in different jurisdictions. Also, instead of picking sides for or against both, perhaps we could strike a compromise between Malaysia and the UK, as seen in Canada. This also suggests that actions of battery and medical treatment can be brought only when no consent was given at all. Where, apart from emergency situations, treatment has been given beyond what has consent been consented to. Therefore, based on the discussion, it can be said that to a large extent, the bonus test is no longer relevant. However, it does provide uniformity and consistency. So, that's all we have time here on TLA Today. Thank you very much for joining us, and don't forget that the conversation continues on Twitter at TLA Today. See you next time.